Abdullah Fularen Harris is a Nigerian-born comedian um, and entertainer whose humor and magnetic personality has earned him more than 750,000 followers on IG and counting. Um, an exploding global fan base and is currently working as an executive producer, writer, and actor for the upcoming episodes of African Time. Dula is a graduate of Hampton University, and Hampton is an HBCU, so that's dope. Um, he's a member of Omega Sci-Fi fraternity. They call them Q-Dogs, right? Uh, and he's also known for his role uh, as Tunde in the viral web series African Time with over 8 million streams. Um, Dula is also uh, has made some strong appearances on comedy stages and hosted events across the country and the world. And so, um, Dulo, what is your Nigerian name? Okay, yes, I know people, you guys know me as Dulo, but my full name is Abdulazim Falani Akinlolu Harris. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again. Abdulazim Falani Akinlolu Harris. Just call me Dulo for sure, because too many people trip up on it. Dope. Just call me Dulo. Don't please, I don't have time for you to be fixing everybody's. <laughs> So given that issue, I think most of us Africans have the same issue as far as like long African names mm -hmm. and people can't pronounce it. Was that part of the inspiration in African time when you told your son to like? Absolutely. Um, in African time, that's, that's the. Yes, yeah, the series, the web series. In African time, the inspiration for that was pretty much not even just Africans, all immigrants. I think all immigrants face the same um, situation when it comes to just uh, you know, dealing with their American counterparts. And the first one is, you know, names. Me, not, not even just my name, how I smelled, because I used to come from the house smelling like goat meat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, why, because, you know, we cook. You know, like in the African, if, it, if you've never been to African household, you smell the food. The food is very, food is potent. The food, you know, it makes sense. So, like, I used to get, you know, make fun of, you smell like, what, is, what does that smell? So on and so forth, so like, you know, but African booty scratcher or African time, was, the inspiration was really just to tell the story of really, not even Amer or Africans or Nigerians who were born here, but just Africans in, in general who have to assimilate to American culture and American norms. Yeah, I can relate to that. Um, I definitely got called African booty scratcher. Mm -hmm. um, funny now, right? Um, but people want to know who you are. You know, when you're an internet personality, you've, you've kind of taken time to develop this persona. Obviously, it's a booming industry and you're doing well. But who are you? Like, you know, where were you born? Were you born here in Nigeria? Tell us about the you know early stages. Okay, so for me, I was born I was born in Newark, New Jersey. Okay. Yeah, but I was raised in Lagos, Nigeria. Like literally, some people probably relate to me. Our parents, some our parents. I, so shout out to African parents because I know my parents. They were so smart to make sure they had their affairs in Nigeria, but they made sure they bond me here in America. You understand me? You understand me? Like. <laughs> Like, that's, that's, that's major key, though. Like, I, I know they were doing whatever they were doing, but they made sure they, had, they were visiting my uncle in, Roch in um, Rochester, New York, but they had me in Newark, New Jersey, okay. right? So, uh, <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, so I know that was by, you know, by, by, you by, know, design. by design. Yeah. So, um, shout out to them. And just to give us a further, a better opportunity just to have dual citizenship. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I was born, they sent me back to Nigeria, mm -hmm. you know, for culture, so on and so forth. So, you know, respect. Things of that nature, even me. The, the only reason why I feel like I even do African comedy is because I lived in Nigeria my first nine years. You understand? My first schooling was in Nigeria. You know, so um, uh, essentially, the reason why you know we did this African time is really just to show people, you know, what and you know why and how Africans you know deal with American society as Nigerians or as Africans. Yeah, I think uh, that's very relatable, um, and. I share a story with you, you know, like backstage. Um, the comedy sometimes makes people feel at home. Mm -hmm. You know, people get homesick a lot and they're far away. And um, I have a special, like a special message from one of my coworkers um, at YouTube. And um, at the time, her father had a stroke, and he was he was you know in the hospital for like 10, 15 days. And when she saw the email that I sent out, uh, she said, hey, I would like you to pass this message on. And basically what happened, she said, she stayed 10 nights in the hospital. And when she got on Instagram, she saw your page, and she just couldn't stop laughing. In the, in the most dark times of her life, your comedy was able to kind of shine some brightness and bring her some peace and solace. And so uh, tell us about how you feel when you make comedy from an African perspective. and. How do you expect that to impact people in the world? For me, uh, when I make comedy, I know it's going to impact people. Like, even before I even had 
but even before I even had many followers on Instagram, so I knew whatever I was going to do would impact people. And for to just to answer your question, um, with this lady who said that her father had a stroke, I've had you know multiple people reach out to me and tell me that uh, you know the things that I put on the line, the things that I put on the internet, so on and so forth, just help them. Um, and those are the, I, I believe those are the reasons why I even do what I do. Because before I even had many followers, I literally had a guy who was a football player. He played in a, I think St. John's in New York. He was a star football player. And he sent me a message said, I might be committing suicide. This is no joke. Wow. I feel like committing suicide. I went straight to his page. This guy was adored by his little brother. Everyone liked him. He was a star captain of this football team. And, um, and he's like, your posts, they just, you know, they put a smile on my face. And that was really, this before I even knew that I had this gift. You understand me? That was the major thing that pushed I will never forget it. It pushed me forward to continue to do what I'm doing. And like maybe a year after that, he sent me pictures of his graduation. Wow. So I was like, whoa, this is something I need to stick to. I know that, you know, humor. And it's not even that I planned it, trust and believe me. I know it's a gift. I feel like I'm a vessel through God just to do whatever I do for whoever sees it. Not for the, everybody, but whoever sees what I do. I know it's, it's on purpose and it's for a reason. So when you tell me that, not that I'm not surprised, I'm humbled, but I know my reason for doing what I do on a daily basis. Did you think you'd be here today? No. <laughs> Listen, you like, no, seriously. like, did I think I would be here today? Absolutely not. Because for me, it wasn't planned. I did not plan this. I was literally, when I started even like, you know, for the whole comedy thing, I literally was sitting in the basement living with my brother. I was living with my brother. Um, I had a very entry level job at American University. I was, uh, my, 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 my position was material specialist. That sounds very fancy. I was stockroom manager. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I was managing stockrooms left and right on the campus, ladies and gentlemen. You need more light bulbs, I can get you more light bulbs. Uh, you need tiles, I, wait, I have the tiles for you. Mat <laughs> material specialist sounded extreme, you know. So I was, you know, I was doing that, a very humble job. So, and, and at the time, uh, I knew I had a son coming. So I'm trying to tell you, like, you know, when they tell you pressure uh, develops diamonds or pressure, you know, develops, you yeah. know, whatever that saying is, I literally held pressure and being African, Trust me, my parents did not know I had a son coming until he was seven months in the belly. If that makes sense. Like, it's some, being African is something like you have this pressure. So I had this pressure to, you know, okay, what am I going to do with my life? All right, so getting these, um, so I was literally, like I was saying, I was sitting in the basement of my brother's, um, apartment. my brother's apartment. There was already Twitter there, okay? I had already known that I wanted to do something great, and I had also, there's something, I, I guess you can ask me about Twitter later. But essentially, yeah. Essentially, I just posted one video, like not knowing I was going to do anything. It wasn't going to be just because Instagram had a um, video now. I posted one video like that. And like, I mean, I, I didn't even look at Instagram for two weeks. Came back two weeks later. It was like, where's your next video? Where's your next video? I was like, OK, this might be something. To the point where like, my cousins were like, hey, do this, do this, and so on and so forth. Long story short, it just snowballed. And now I'm here. So no, I did not think I would be here today. And I think like we can all like you know relate to that story. Most of us at Google, you know, when you look around the room, you see people from you know different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, I know I myself just a little anecdote. Um, grew up as a refugee kid for 13 years at Google. 15 years later, after moving to the U.S., that was not a, you know like a possibility that I could imagine. But one cool thing that happened: uh, his first tweet uh, was in 2011, and it was Hakuna Matata. It means, you know, don't worry, everything is going to be all right. And so when you think about what technology has done for your career, um, how are you thinking about creating, you know, new content and what platforms, medium, and how do you see the intersection of technology with your work and how is it helping you? I mean, technology, I, I wouldn't be here for, if it wasn't for, te for technology. Like you said, um, my first tweet was in uh, 2011. I graduated college in 2010, where everybody in school was using Twitter. I had no reason in my mind. It was like, why do I need to be tweeting my thoughts? What do, and people like little people, oh, we're going to the cafeteria. And, uh, the ice cream sorbet is delicious today. Like, I had no real, like, what, this is what people were tweeting. So I had no desire to tweet these things. Then I graduated. Shortly after I graduated, I was expecting my son, and, um, which is in 2011, where you see that I tweeted at Kunamata, and I promise you, you reminded me that that was my first tweet, and I can already put myself there. I was thinking about, okay, you got this child coming. You're going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. <laughs> I can promise you that's what I was thinking. So with that being said, um, that was my first tweet. And with Twitter, brother, technology, I, I knew that tech, okay. I went to small school in Hampton University, 2,500 people. That's it. And 
I knew that, you know, if you want to be something great or if you want to be wealthy in any way, right, especially financially, if you want to be wealthy, you have to either be born in it, mm -hmm. um, someone has to dash you the money, which means give you the money for people who don't know what dash means. <laughs> Nigeria means to dash, not to run away. But, um, you know, someone has to give you the money or um, you have to work for it. You have to be an athlete, someone, a singer, you have to have a talent, right? Or, you know, you just have to have a lot of people know what you do because if you sell sand, if a lot of people know that you sell sand, you will make a lot of money. Mm. If you sell water, a lot of people know you sell water, you'll make a lot of money. If you sell anything, right? And for me, I did not know what I was going to sell. But I knew that, okay, whenever I have this idea that I'm going to sell something, people must be able to be there. They must be able to drink whatever I'm, I'm serving. So with Twitter, I literally had no, I had no, I, I tweeted Akuna Matata, I believe, like you said. And I really, I literally, for me, I started to, um, I knew that I had, even my school with 2,500 people, that's not enough people to be great. 2,500, if, even, if, if everybody on my school was to follow me or to know what I did on a grand scale, that's not even not enough. 2,500 people, that's nothing. So I said to myself, all these people were tweeting. I was like, okay, the best way to, uh, to, to have followers is to follow somebody. The best way to get a subscriber is to ask them if you want to subscribe. East Bay. Back in the day, they used to send, do you want to subscribe to our thing? Do you want to subscribe? Do you want to subscribe? Do you want to subscribe? People would say no, but I know at least one person out of 100 said yes. Mm. So when it comes to Twitter, ladies and gentlemen, I went on Twitter and I, I subscribed to a lot of people. You know, people who I feel like would be interested in what I did. In no time, I had people who were subscribing to me just because I was subscribing to them. In no time, I felt like I jailbroke. Yes. I jailbroke Twitter, and this is a secret, not even a secret, but this is how. You want to ask me how did I even get a, my jump start on social media? I literally, ladies and gentlemen, I followed on so many people where Twitter locked me out. <laughs> <laughs> they locked me out from following people, right? But the blessing was the people who were decided, oh, he might be interesting enough to follow, they were still following me, if that makes sense. So I jailbroke it essentially where like my following ratio was going beyond the people who I was following, ladies and gentlemen. Because, just because of Twitter was like, okay, you can't follow nobody else. Yeah, but these people yeah. were still following me. So that spilled into like Instagram and uh, people with Android having Instagram, so on and so forth. And, like no time, these followers, they spilled into Instagram. And now I was able to, you know, feed this content, the, the, the what is this, you know, basic comedy content, so on and so forth. And it just went snowball and viral. And like, you know, now I'm here. So it's not easy to be funny. You know, mm -hmm. I actually signed up for a comedy class once, and I didn't go. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I wanted to feel the feeling of being booed, mm -hmm. because I felt like that would be like my worst. Boo this man, ladies and gentlemen. He wasn't, I'm no, 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 I'm joking, I'm joking. You want to feel, just ask people to boo you. <laughs> no, but like, talk about, talk about, you know, what goes into, you know, like a video, what goes into the series. How do you kind of come up with these creative ideas, and? How much work do you put into what we see and laugh at? I mean, for me, I, I've always known, even before comedy, I've always known that I was a very silly individual. Uh -huh. Like, I, I can, and it could be a problem. It could be a blessing and a curse sometimes. In any situation, I can lie. Any situation, I can find humor out of it in some way. So it does not matter. That's just me, ladies and gentlemen. Like, I was pulled over once, and, I lit and the, the cop said, how are you doing? I said, I'm blessed, sir. <laughs> And the cop looked at me like, how can you be blessed? I'm about to give you a ticket. <laughs> how can you be blessed? He, you know, and he just felt something. He let me go with a warning just because, and I know I'm speeding. So like, um, but like when it comes to, when it comes to. Don't try that. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't try that. Trust me. Trust me. I was pledging at the time, so I don't care if I went to jail or not. I promise you. That's a true story. Um, but uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to comedy, like, you know, you understand that everybody deals with, so we all deal with the same stuff. No matter what, we all have family, we all have relationships, we might have pets, we might have favorite food, but we all deal with the same thing. So for me, when it comes to putting a humor in the thing, I just try to almost sit in everyone's seat. How can everybody, how can everyone kind of relate to something? To, to something? That's why my, my main, my baby, that, that's, you haven't seen much of you know, African time, is a thing that we're really invested in that we're writing, that obviously it's not a lot of things that you guys can see visually. But on the back end, where, you know, it's, it's a lot of stuff going down on the back end. So, um, with that being said, like we're just literally and that on top of other other you know shows, um, we're just really just doing our best to sit back and see how we can relate to everybody, and you know just you know put forth the best content. So what's happening with African time? Oh, okay, um, just 
the fact of the matter is that African time, there's a big TV station um, who's interested in it. And so we're not going to put nothing else on YouTube until the writer who is writing for um, The Simpsons is done with his contract there, and then we could come back. Wow. So that just takes patience Clap and time. Clap this man, y'all. Wow. So do you feel some type of responsibility for educating people through your humor about African culture or at least Nigerian culture? Absolutely. 100%. That's why some, if you guys you know, follow me, like, I don't curse much. Mm. If I do curse, it, it almost makes sense. OK, you know, you, like you understand. Because <laughs> some people, to be funny, they curse recklessly for no reason. Because cursing is funny. Right, so for me, I don't curse much. One thing you can't do in an African household is like, can't be recklessly cursing. Who do you think you are, mm -hmm. right? So for me, like, yes, it's a point to, um, to, to educate in everything I'm doing. Like, you know, there's always a lesson in everything, period. Even in the, when I do my voiceovers, all right, those, those, those characters, they're, they're educated. Even though, you know what I'm saying, it might be, even science, they, you know what I'm saying, it might be, they might be talking about something funny, but there might be something scientific in there or mathematic in there. Just, we're just not talking about reckless or, you know, just things that don't matter. Everything in there is, is intelligent and whatnot. So like, and I, I aim to be funny intellectually. That's smart. Yes. Take us behind what it takes for you to get rights to these videos and like some of the technical difficulties mm -hmm that you run into? Okay, the, the biggest technical difficulty I run into is when they just remove the video, okay? Why do I say that? Because sometimes I don't get rights to videos, but most of the videos I get, these people who own lions, monkeys, tigers, they send me videos, funny videos that they own. People own cats, dogs, regular things, almost like uh, America's Funniest Videos. People literally email me videos, y'all, like, oh, can you make a video of my, my daughter and my, the twins, so on and so forth. So I get it directly, and it's something I don't even have to search for. Thank God, because they know this is what he does, and people actually want to see me voice over their funny stuff, so on and so forth. Do you give disclaimer, don't send me like your reckless videos? Um, I don't, it, the thing is, with my character, you know, with African Dad, people yeah. know not to try African Dad. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm serious, like, I don't, I promise you, and it's a blessing, because people, you know, like, they, if you know me, you know I'm, I'm a goofy person, I can be extremely serious, but when it comes to, like, you know, like, online, I don't really get much, and it's a blessing. Because the characters I portray, like, I don't, it's respect. Everything I do, I want, to, I want you to respect it, laugh at my stuff. But don't look at me like a full clown, because I'm not a clown. I do, besides, you know, comedy, I do a lot of other stuff, too. Yeah, you know, you got a little Miller rocking everywhere. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing a lot of work. Yep. When do, I mean, May is Mental Health you know, Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, comedy helps relieve people, like, from stress, pain, and, you know, different types of you know, traumas, right? How do you self-serve? How do you take time for Dulo? What do you do? For me, um, I have, you know, I, I, a lot of people don't know that I have, that I have a son. I have a seven-year-old son, all right? I've, and he's been, like, okay, so you guys know now because I told you he's been the inspiration from the jump start. So for me, it's just, you know, just vibing with my son, my family, um, my parents. Uh, I'm just literally, you know, just enjoying them because they know what I do. They know. Uh, they know how much you know I put into what I do, and they respect the risk that it is. Mm -hmm. My family does. They're the risk, and whatnot. Um, and so for me, just enjoying them is that's the best feeling that I have, other than creating content. So you're successful, and there are roads ahead that you can, you know, mountains ahead that you might climb and just keep growing, keep becoming more. Are your parents actually proud that you're doing comedy as a Nigerian? I mean, you know, as a Nigerian, you already know. <laughs> Even technology, nothing, doctor. If you want to play football, be a football doctor. You understand me? <laughs> if you want to be on anybody's field, be a football doctor. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> and you're like so, like, you know, so, the, and for me, God is good because it came around full circle. Initially, no. Like, I quit my job. I quit my job in 2015 after, you know, like, being able to, you know, balance working and, I, and, you know, building gigs and building, you know, this side of the business and whatnot. But my parents, obviously, they would pick something different from me. But when their, when their, parent, when their friends, or when they, you know, they would go to their friend's house and they'd be like, ah, I saw, are you, I am Dulo's mother. Are you, I am Dulo's dad, and so on and so forth. And, you know, they started recognizing my family through me. That's when it came around full circle for them. Like, I promise you, my mom told me the story. My mother was always a good supporter. But when she told me the story, when my father realized that it was me, they were, they were at some party, so on and so forth, and someone's, 
uh, you know, every, you know, and Africans were all cousins. You know what I'm saying? So all of us. So my auntie, my auntie was like, you know, one of my aunties was like, I, I saw you on the internet, on Instagram, so on and so forth. So and and my mom was like, yeah, my son is, and that's my dad. Literally hopped on a bandwagon right there. You know what I mean? Like it was like, ah, I am doing that's my son now. Yes, I was ah comedy. I used to do comedy now. Ah, when there, I was teaching that joke there. I was the one who taught him that joke. Ah, that's my favorite joke. And he hopped on it right there and then. And ever since then, my dad literally follow. You know, my, they know because you know when someone someone you know is like, okay, yeah, I, your your son does this. And it is really, that's the best way. I can't really tell you. It, you know, and when someone else shows you, it's the best way, I believe. Um, Dulo told me that this is his first interview, sit down. And it was important for him because, I mean, it's not that he didn't get calls, but the internet technology is what, you know, catapulted his career. And when Google came asking, he just felt like it was right to do this here. Um, what's... Um, What's something that, as a technology company, Google or Africans working at a technology company, what's something that we could do to help uplift the voices of young creators or African creators? I mean, I think you guys are on the path. Because for one thing, uh, what I would say, I, I think, I'm not sure, if this is your second annual? Is this, is this the second? Third. This third, is the third. Third, yeah. As you can say, you get, we're, we're baby stepping it now. This is the third annual. So what, what can we do? Yeah, I think we're on the path to doing what you guys want to do. Or, you know, we're on the path, because I feel like next year will be something grander. The next year will be something grander. Um, the fact that this is only the third year means, you know, we're on baby we're steps here. Yeah, we're going somewhere. So it's, it's just to stay steadfast and um, to be consistent in what we're doing. Make sure we do this again next year with another influencer or someone else, who, you know, who, who inspires so on and so forth. Because when I leave here, or once this is all captivated in two, what, two weeks, I'm going to share it with the world. You know, and I'm sure some influencers are going to, hey, how do I get into there? And they will be reaching out to come in yeah, and send them, send them my way. And, and that's something that, that's, that's what this will do. It's going to promote that. And that's what we do. Awesome. Um, he's a quarter percent Liberian, mm -hmm. right? And 25 percent. You know, quarter. <laughs> and he's excited. Mm -hmm. Ah, he, he jumped across the room just to hug me. <laughs> you guys have to understand, you know, it's kind of like, you know, being the only black person, it's like I'm always the only Liberian, right? So, I mean, I had to jump in that bandwagon. And, and Iota, yeah. Um, so let's talk about Jalof. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> record this, record this. <laughs> let's talk about Jalof. Okay. <laughs> What's your take on the state of Jalof? <laughs> okay. In West Africa. In, in West? Af yeah. In West Africa. Yeah. You okay, I mean. the most Nigerian answer. Oh, no, I'm not. The thing is, I'm going to throw you guys off. The fact about Jalaf is, we all know, if you're smart, anyone who's educated, anyone who's smart enough or who has any type of sense, you know that Jalaf originated in Senegal. Facts. Right? Any Senegalese in the building? You from Senegal? Any? Yeah, Senegalese? back there. Okay. All right, respect to the Senegalese. See how, exactly. So, 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 so Jalaf originated there, okay? Similarly to how uh, uh, flight originated in North Carolina, okay? Yeah, did I didn't they, know that. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> they didn't know that. All right, yes, yes. It was like, what? Flight, huh? like the plane. The first, like <laughs> listen, listen, the first airplane was in, the first airplane, they're the ones who took the first in flight, North Carolina. All right, but they're not, they're not the ones who perfected the Boeing jets. You understand? So Senegal, you guys just started the thing. You just started it, okay? Ninja, we are the ones who perfected flight. Understand me, okay? That's just, to, you know, it was never quite, just to break that down, yes. So Senegal, you guys factored it. You have some people who practice so on and so forth. Who had the summa cum magna cum of Jalaf rice? You understand me? Okay. So like Jalaf, okay, so for you guys to even understand. So you know how there's, there's uh, what's it called? Bing, there's Yahoo, <laughs> and there's Google. We had the Google of Jalaf rice. You know? <laughs> yeah, just for you to get it. Just for you to just, just for y'all. Okay, we're the oh, Google. Man. Okay, just so, just, we're the search engine. We're the Google. Of, <laughs> <laughs> you just going. You just going in. Yeah, continue to go, but let's oh go. man. Yeah. Um, you didn't. You didn't want. You wish you didn't ask that question. No, no. Uh, I actually, we actually had a Jalof event mm -hmm. two weeks ago, and you know, it was. <laughs> the, Niger the Nigerians. Like from there. We just the Nigerians there. won, you know, but it wasn't the fair ratio. And but um, okay. <laughs> hey, but hey, 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 but to be but to be fair, Nigerians, Ghanaians, anybody who's in the building, I have Nigerian aunties who can't cook. 
You from certain. It depends on who cooks it. Let's be. You know, all jokes aside. It depends on who cooks Please, it, man. Come on now. Aside. All jokes aside, <laughs> it depends on who cooks. I have aunties who can't cook worth crap. <laughs> okay? And then I'm sure you have people who can't cook, so it depends on who cooks it. At the end of the day, just to be fair to the whole Jalof community. Well, <laughs> um, we want to open up to you guys. We have about 20 minutes. Um, if you have questions, uh, raise your hand. The mic is going to come around. Um, anything, let's have a dialogue. Thank you so much for being with um, us here today and, and taking the time to speak with us. Um, I cannot remember the name of the show now, but I just saw a promo for it, and it stars a, a Nigerian nurse, and it's written... Oh, right. So I don't know if you've touched on this already. No, okay, great. Um, just kind of want to get your take on what this, what is this new landscape for, for art and content, and even kind of now that it's on premier channels, what does that look like for the African community, for the Nigerian community? Um, it's very interesting to see that it's already out there, but it also kind of goes with some of the usual, like a Nigerian nurse. We're like, yeah, we know a lot of those. What other things can, can we do? What's your take on where it is now and where it could be and what you're excited about in terms of feature films, TV, that sort of thing? I mean, where is, where is this now? I think after, predominantly after Black Panther, yeah? I feel like, okay, that really opened the gate to do African things in, you know, just in Hollywood or just, you know, in the film industry, so on and so forth. Now, I believe uh, the easiest, especially with humor, you know, that show that you're talking about is a comedy, all right? So, especially with humor, um, and what people want to laugh at is necessarily, not necessarily, oh, uh, you living lavishly. It's the struggle. And so, you know, what? with any nurse who has to work, in, you know, in that show, I feel like, nonetheless, I know about that show, but... People, um, people who want to watch comedy, so and so, they want to see the struggle. And like a nurse who's struggling, she's taking the bus. You've seen it, right? She's living at home with the family, so on and so forth. That's what people want to laugh at. And the grand scheme of things, we know we're in America, which is you know we're predominantly white. That's what we, you know, especially when it comes to South Africa. Don't what can we laugh at at the end of the day? So um, and and for Adi, uh, Adi Shola, who's she's a comedian, you know, that's her angle. So I expect that from her, you know. Um, the people who wrote Black Panther, you know, the angle is more Marvel, so on and so forth. So they didn't want to show, you know, that, that aspect. Me, who I'm writing African time, and we've only, you know, seen, you guys only seen what y'all seen. There's going to be down times. There's going to be struggle. You're going to see a whole bunch of things that we go through, period. So um, I think as long as it's authentic and real, it's going to be felt. Thank you. That's it. Stop it up, stop it up. Hi, I have a question as it relates to collaboration, both with like other people in the industry, whether it be like an African ape or, you know, that kind of mm -hmm. work, or even people who are like up and coming that, you know, based on your hustle and how you got from being at Hampton to where you are, do you feel like an obligation to collaborate with them and try to build this whole big thing, you know? Um, when we first, when I first started on social media, after like I, you know, like kind of like I was just the person that I, you know, became. And then people started, like, you know, reaching out, hey, Dulo, like, African Ape, you mentioned African Ace now. Um, that's my bro, that's my brother. He reached out to me, he was like, you know, can I put my stuff on your platform? You put my stuff on your platform and kind of see if we can intertwine and, like, you know, build up like that. Yes, that's something that we did heavily back um, years ago. And for me, um, I've, after I started doing African time, right, I felt like I, uh, it, not even I felt like it, it, almost like people, especially in my community, in the African, we stopped, we stopped like you know doing the sharing, so on and so forth, because we actually wanted to just, you know, branch off and do their, you know, do your own thing, and that's something that I, made mainly wanted to do, like really, I want to kind of grow by myself, see how I can grow by myself without doing shares, like organic is what you guys would call it, right? Mm -hmm. Organically, let me do it organically, so on and so forth, and that's where I'm at now. But when it comes to collaborating, um, collaborating, um, I feel like that's what that's my next tier is I want to do heavy collaborations, that things that will be able to go on YouTube, you know, with, with my brother here, and, um, you know, just, you know, grander things with other influences that are just not, um, that are just not African influences. So uh, I'm African American, but I've always been really interested in the diaspora, and so since you went to an HBCU and you were in a, a fraternity, uh, I take it by fraternity probably, um, I'm just curious about how you think about connecting across the diaspora between Africans, African Americans and Africans, and how that might 
or how that has influenced your comedy and and uh, and how that will uh, influence what you do going forward. Sorry about that. Yeah. So when it comes to being in the fraternity, first and foremost, being African, our parents do not even look at fraternities. They think it's a cult. So for me. Yeah, African parents think fraternities is a cult. So me, like my me, even pledging was a secret. They did not know that I was a, that I was in, in a fraternity. But merging it, like making it through the fraternity, your American account, which is a, it's a you know these fraternities are black, not African organizations. They're black owned organizations. So these people, they know exactly where you're from. Me personally, they knew I was the African guy on the line, pledging. So they really helped me. I would say they helped me kind of, you know, cultivate myself. As, as far as comedy goes, like, you know, pledging, you have to kind of have personality. You have to have some sort of character, charisma. And being online, I'm pledging to my fraternity, which is Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated. They helped me cultivate that. And moving forward, as being a, com a comedy who's also, I mean, a comedian who's also a Q now, um, all the black um, uh, Omegas, they know me as the African uh, funny Q so on and so forth, or the, oh, that's the African bro who's funny, so on and so forth. So it's something that just really goes hand in hand, like, you know, we're a fraternity, so everyone kind of knows what's going on. And I think even looking at your, your logo, you incorporate, you know, kind of your, your fraternity sign exactly. as, you know, that identifier, mm -hmm. but then coming from an African perspective. Um, with the Nigerian you know, flag in the yeah, back. Yeah, you know, exactly. with the Nigerian flag in the back. And, and I think... I think we all have a responsibility, you know, to your question, um, to bridge culture, right? Because I remember when I grew up, in, I grew up in Oklahoma, right, of all places. Uh, I went to school, an all-black school, and the black kids, you know, were like, I'm a foreign person. I was like, yo, this is crazy. But looking back 10, 13 years ago to where we are now with the internet and access and information and Afrobeats and people on the other side of the diaspora scene, like Africa is just not about the booty scratcher. Mm -hmm. Africa is just not about the lion, tigers, and bears. It's actually about dopeness, right, culture. And so now it's just like, even some Africans that, you know, for a longer time didn't want to like Same lean part. into the Africanness or like, you know, kind of like, you know, being steadfast. And even, you know, African-American that wanted to pull far, like further away from it are now leaning in. So I think the more, we're able to kind of like showcase that we're intelligent, smart, funny, you know, husbands, wives, brothers, sisters to each other, the more that connection, you know, kind of gets stronger. And even now, like a lot of people are very curious. I saw, and speaking of like, you know, I think I touched on uh, Black Panther. Like I saw um, Chadwick, was it, you know? Chadwick Boseman. Exactly. He, he's um, done his, like I guess he has a partnership with Ancestry.com. African Ancestry. African Ancestry. Yeah. Com. So, um, these things are literally allowing people to go back because we were going from, Af you know, hey, you're African booty scratchers. Uh, Hey man, hey, I that jollof, can I taste some jollof? Can you bring some of that jollof here so we can taste it? So like, I mean, and for me, and, and I think with humor and with comedy is just the best way everybody can relate first and foremost. And with comedy, um, everybody, like it doesn't matter if you're African, you could be uh, uh, Indian, you could be Asian, you could be Hispanic. All of these people really, especially the people who are, you know, immigrants, everyone kind of relates because our parents come here with the same kind of mindset. Mm -hmm. Which is really to, we, we didn't come here to play. We came here to better ourselves. We left somewhere that was a little bit worse than this. This is a better place. Now let's, let's project. Let's elevate. Um, Stanley. So you've been doing comedy for years, but you said you didn't leave your job until 2015. Yes. How did you know you were ready at that point? And what's your advice to someone who may be at a similar juncture or earlier in high school or college and is getting that pressure from their family to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer? Because I have friends who have gone to great schools, have gotten mechanical engineering degrees, gotten MBAs, and then six years into their degree they, or their career, they leave and become a singer or a rapper. Mm -hmm. So what, what's your advice there? I mean, my advice is to wait until you feel right. And the number one advice is really to go with your gut and go with your feeling. For me, um, I was blessed enough to actually already been in the motion of what I'm doing before I, you know, before I you know, left my job. I was able to kind of like, you know, I was working in accounting, so I had my screen and I was still doing my thing, really just doing whatever I had to do while I was at work. So, um, and the, my trigger, no, I knew that I could leave my job was once, when, when I knew I could leave my job, I had a gig at University of Pennsylvania, Penn State, I'm sorry, at Penn State University, the host, um, it's called something they call Apollo Night. Mm -hmm. And they offered me $5,000 to do this Apollo Night, okay? I was making, what? 1400 in two weeks, 
You understand me? So like, it was easy for me to kind of translate and know, like, okay, I'm kind of onto something here. And I talked to my boss as well. My boss told me a story um, about Bernie Mac. Bernie Mac did Apollo years ago, all right? And I mean, obviously, um, rest his soul. Bernie Mac did Apollo. He made $5,000, $5, and that's when he quit his job. Same exact story. So, and my boss is the one who told me, he said, I think it's time for you to leave my boss. We cut cake and everything when I left. So it was a celebration when I left, because they had already known that, all right, this guy is something. Like, I'd already done gigs at my school that I was working at before I quit, if that makes sense. So like, it was already, it was a blessing. I made sure I was, I didn't like just leap out there and jump out there unknowingly. Just kind of make sure that you, you, know, you have something aligned if you're not willing to you know, take the full risk. And I think, yeah. I mean, that speaks, to, that speaks to like preparation, right? That speaks to like testing, right? I think a lot of times we just see success. Right. Oh, Dulo is funny. He's making all this money. You know, popularity. But you have to really, you know, you, know, you you have to like, you know, kind of trial. You know, keep trying, and then at some point, you know that you are good, or you know that you are at a trajectory that you can catapult and like move faster if you give yourself the time. So it's never okay to just kind of dive into like something new. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, any other questions? How are you monetizing yourself? And also, are you looking at other platforms outside of social media? Uh, yeah, I know you mentioned YouTube. Um, just wanted to get your idea what you're thinking about the future. Well, my major thing is um, events, live events, doing hosting events. As an African, they do, Africans will bring any type of comedian to any event, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Because somebody could buy a, somebody could really buy a car. Please come and help make make fun of the car. You feel me? Yeah. So like Africans, you know, it could be a birthday party, a wedding, a baby shower, naming ceremony. Africans or you know Nigerians in particular, we literally bring people just to make it festive because that's what we do. We like to have fun. When it's time to celebrate, we want to celebrate well. We want to celebrate with laughter. That's why. I mean, that's really how I make most of my money. Is literally doing live events, showing up to places, and doing live things. And that's why I continue to keep content online. That's okay, you guys see me here. So you guys, as you're doing things, oh, there's this guy, he made me laugh. Let's see if we can book him. It's a probability thing. The more I put out, it's more, the more I put out, the more probability somebody gonna book me to do something live. So it's a scientist, it's a science for me, so. So you out here like just moving physics and stuff? Physics and trigonometry and mathematics. There's a lot of intricate things. Pythagorean theorem, a lot oh, of stuff. Man. That's dope, man, that's good. Any other questions? You've uh, talked a lot about the, the acceptance of uh, Nigerian and, and African culture as a whole in, in America or outside of, of Africa. Um, where do you see the opportunities to mainstream uh, African culture in, in, in the U.S. And, and make it more commercial in the, in the positive light especially, um, whereas you know, all the negative connotations that we've all seen growing up? Um, I would say in, in addition to comedy, I think music is something that really goes. I mean, I want to say shout out to Davido. You know what I'm saying? Everybody here knows Davido. Like, Davido is an artist and I think a, a human being, a Nigerian, who's literally found a way to transcend and just through, obviously, American, France, everywhere. You know what I mean? So, like, when it comes to, like, um, you know, like Nigerian entertainment being able to go mainstream, I think it's going to start with music mainly. That's going to be the bigger thing for its which is. I think that's already shown itself. With Afro be taking a, a crazy, it's just really blazing the just the you know the music scene right now for everyone. I know everybody from Asians, people who know if. I know everybody who can sing if. You guys know that song if, obviously. Everyone knows that song if. So I think um first when it goes through music, then people are like, man, that song is dope, so on and so forth. And it's going to transition to um film. And I, I really believe that I'm gonna be a pillar in, in that with when it comes to um, just, you know, film, especially with, you know, what I've kind of shared with you guys today. I really believe I'll be a pillar in that. Facts. Clap it up, clap it up. Uh, we're almost done, uh, but I want to, I want to bring you back here, right? Like, what are some things that, that you are most afraid of moving forward? You know, doing what you're doing, the amount of success you've seen, and obviously you've seen the other side, people who didn't make it to where you are. What are you most afraid of or intimidated by? The thing is, I'm going to be extremely candid and humble with everybody here. And, you, you know, I'm here, right? I feel so blessed to be here. But I don't even feel, not to disintegrate or dim, diminish what we're doing here and how we're here, but 
bro, I feel like I'm not even started. You know what I mean? Right. I feel like I have so much more to do. So much more that I like. I feel like my my platform is not where it needs to be to even show yet. You know what I mean? Like things that I've shared with you guys that you guys are going to see on a different platform. Can't put that. That's not for Instagram. Like I don't feel like, you know, Instagram is a platform to show these things. But we're, you guys, these things you guys will see, so on and so forth. So like my fears, is I don't necessarily. I don't think I have a, like not necessarily fears. You know, and my fear would would literally be you know like not to be able to continue to do what I'm doing. But I don't have any fears. I just know I have to do. I, we cannot live with fear. I guess it essentially. I mean, you're asking me my question, right? But essentially, that's whatever it is you're doing, you cannot be afraid. It does not matter what you're doing. You, like, fear is literally just telling yourself, let me slow down a little bit. You put fear is like breaking, put it, pushing the brakes as you're going down the hill. That's what fear is, on purpose, because it's, 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 it's a mind killer. That's what fear is, you know what I mean? It's a mind killer, and it's not even real. You know, so like, I don't really believe in fear. I wouldn't have, I don't think I'd be here if I was afraid of, you know what I'm saying, what we're doing. So no fears, bro. It's just blessings and, you know, praying, asking God and keeping faith. I promise you. Um, a lot of people don't know I'm, 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 uh, I'm spiritual. I'm very spiritual. You know what I mean? Like, I'm here because of God, y'all. Like, you know what I mean? I'm here because of God and what I've listened to and him say, hey, you know what? Do this one. Do that. If you do this, hey, that joke that you thought about in your sleep, write that down and finish it off when you wake up. Like, literally, that's, that's how I do it. And I think everyone here is like, you know, we're all like, I don't know. I feel like we're all spiritual people with, you know what I'm saying, like mind, you know, like strong, solid minds. But now nah, we cannot be afraid because you're afraid that's really pushing your own brakes and you expect them to go down this way, but you're pushing, pushing brakes. No, nah, I don't really, I don't, I don't live in fear. That's a good answer. Clap it up. <laughs> somebody once told me, um, somebody once told me fear F-E-A-R is false emotions appearing real. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you're able to kind of hit those acronyms on this head, um, I think that was, that was critical. Um, one, any last words for us? Like, you know, uh, young technical folks at Google? I mean, first, I just want to thank you guys for bringing me on. Just, you know, like you guys are sitting here listening to me, so I'm humbled, you know what I mean? I'm extremely humbled, first and foremost, because I know where I, you know what I'm saying, where I began, you know what I mean? So and so, so like, I just got to thank you guys for even saying, hey, I'm going to come sit and listen to this full talk for an hour. You know what I mean? Like, for you to even do that, that's humbling for me, right? And um, the second thing I would say is literally, man, whatever it is you're doing, everyone here, we're all bosses, we're all like, you know, I feel like we're all solid-minded individuals. To even be here working for Google, I go to Google every single day. All right? Every day I go to Google, I promise you, for one thing or the other. If it's directions, it's for anything. <laughs> You know what I mean? Anything. I go to Google. So, like, for I'm sitting here with, you know, you, the, my African brothers and sisters, and, you know, everyone else who's here, too. We're all African at the end of the day. Let's not even forget that. <laughs> um, you know, we're all African. We're all, we're all African at the end of the day, you know, so in case someone never told you that. <laughs> in case they never told you, we're all, you know, so, like, with that being said, like, you know, just thank you guys for even bringing me out. And whatever it is, I mean, thank you for asking me that question. Whatever it is you want to do, don't have fear in it. Because that's like an invisible brick that you're putting on that idea. Because once God gives you an idea here, to be afraid of that idea, it's like, why would you question what I've given you, my brother or sister? That idea, God gave it to you. How can you question it? Nah. So that's not, no. So just let's not live in fear and let's just, you know, live in faith. Well, give it up for Dula, everybody.